All right, everybody, it is 8.30 on Friday morning. That means we are doing another round of the MREA Book Club. This week is session number four, going over the three L's in the eight goal categories. Now, today, uh, trust you're going to have, if you're watching this on the recording, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this on Facebook, or if you're with us live, I'm trusting that you have this book right in front of you today, the MREA Book and today we're going to be going through this quickly. So I'm going to encourage all of you to have your book out, uh, be ready, flip to page 97, have a pen and a highlighter because man, oh man, this could be, could be one of the most important sections of the book. And I, I will show you what I mean by that in just one second. So let's go ahead uh, and dive in. So on page 97, we're going to start going through the three L's of the millionaire real estate agent. Now, in previous video session three, we talked about the three L's, and the three L's are leads, listings, and leverage. Leads, listings, and leverage. Now, what we also know is that this continues in this section to, um, to be more practical. This, this is where the authors continue to take us down a path of understanding how does this actually show up inside of our business. So, we're going to go ahead and jump in here, guys. Let me uh, stop the share here. All right, we're going to jump in. Now, let's look at this. On page 97, he starts on the, the three L's of the millionaire real estate agent. That section, he starts by talking about the Pareto principle. Now, a lot of you have heard about this. Some of you may not have. And we're going to review it anyway because it does not matter how many times you've heard it. You can always use to hear it again. So, Pareto Principle, just as a little bit of reminder for everybody, Pareto Principle is named after a guy named Pareto. He was an Italian economist. He saw that uh, a big amount of the wealth residing with a small amount of the population. And so long story short, he did a bunch of research, spent a lifetime looking at this, and he developed what we now call the 80-20 principle. Now, if you've read The One Thing, you've heard a lot about this because this was a big part of The One Thing. The reason it's in The One Thing is because Gary Keller, who's one of the authors of the MREA book, has been impacted by the 80-20 principle in a fairly significant way. And so you're going to see it show up in a lot of his writings and a lot of his teachings because it's impacted him very, very significantly. Now, what we know is, uh, what he's saying is 80% of our results, this is on 97 towards the bottom, 80% of our results will come from 20% of our actions. 80% of our results come from 20% of our actions. Now, there's a book here I've not read. He mentions by Richard Koch, The 80-20 Principle. I'm sure it's a great read. But guys, if you pay, turn to page 98, you already have a visual of this. And you probably can understand the 80-20 principle without having to read another book. He says at the top of page 98, most people believe that the time and effort alone deliver results. And while this may be true, the 80-20 rule teaches us that the time and effort on the top 20% that really matters will deliver 80% of the results we seek. Now, what does this look like in your world, in your business, in your real estate office? We all know a lot of agents who we would call busy. We all know a lot of agents who are busy agents, busy people, no doubt about it. And unfortunately, a lot of those busy people are also broke people. You understand the 80-20 principle says that actions and energy does not always translate into results. Actually, to the contrary, a lot of times it doesn't. And it's not because the person doesn't want to do the work. It's not because the person isn't doing work or staying busy. It's because they're focused on the wrong activity. And that's the whole concept of the 80-20 principle. What are we focusing on? Where are we channeling our energy and our effort to get the maximum results? Now, here's what we also know further down there. It says on 98, when we are focused on the 80% that doesn't matter, we tend to get 20% of the results we want. So it doesn't mean you're going to get skunked. You're not going to have no results. However, what it means is you're going to have a ceiling or a capacity on how big you can build your business, on what results you can get. Further down there in that next paragraph, the 20% is the millionaire real estate agent. The 20% the millionaire real estate agent focuses on are the three L's, leads, listings, and leverage. So these three L's, guys, that's why I say this, this next section could be, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of this book because this really could be or should be, and for a lot of top successful people, is the foundation of their massive, massive, massive business. Now turn to page 99. And this is where we're going to start going deeper into this. And guys, we could do a whole call on page 99. On page 99, he goes through lead generation versus lead receiving. Man, there's a massive difference. And guys, right now in a market like we're in, there's a lot of you watching this video who are lead receivers, not lead generators. And I'm going to go through this with you, but this is a very, very, very dangerous position to be in if this is you. Now, he says on the top of page 99, second sentence. 
To have a viable business, you simply must have the client leads. To have a business that pays you a lot of money, you'll need a lot of leads. Now, I think everybody can agree to that. There's some people shaking their heads, yes. That's great. That's great. We all agree with that. Now, for a little further down, he says this. He says, no leads means no sales. Yeah, we probably all still agree with that. He's probably still got all of us on board so far with this. Now, he goes a little bit, next sentence down. He said, think of yourself as being in the lead generation business. Now, here's his point. And I saw this, this is my 14th year in the business. And I've seen a lot of people get into this business. And when they get in, they always get in for two reasons, freedom and flexibility. And when they get in, they all talk about and they have these wild dreams about how amazing it's going to be to help people buy and sell real estate because that's the business they're in. And I hate to break it to you and so does Gary here. That's not the business you're in. The business you're in is lead generation, period, end of story. Because again, like he said before, where you just said you agreed, he said no leads means no sales. So there's a lot of agents who are romanticizing the idea of being in the business of buying and selling homes and helping clients buy and sell homes. And yet they're broke because they forgot their primary business is lead generation. And without doing those activities, without being in that business, they have no one to help buy and sell real estate. Now, a little further down in that paragraph, middle of page 99, he says this, all businesses are, in addition to their particular business, in the lead generation business. What you have to embrace is the fact that it's the number of qualified leads that you have that will either grow your business, keep you in business, or put you out of business. Guys, if you don't have that section underlined, highlighted, and starred, something is wrong with you, okay? Middle of page 99, I'm going to read it again because this is how important this is. All businesses, in addition to their particular business, are in the lead generation business. What do you have to, or what you have to embrace is this, and underline this section, what you have to embrace is the fact that it's the number of qualified leads that you have that will either grow your business, keep you in business, or put you out of business. Now, guys, what a lot of people don't know if you're newer to Keller Williams, and I, by newer, I mean in the last 10 years, um, there's another couple names on this book. Gary Keller's the primary, that's the one in the white, right? The second name there is a guy named Dave Jenks. Now, Dave was a part of KW really early on. Dave was an advisor to Gary. Dave was a contributor to this book. Dave's a really, really smart guy. And when I got into the business, Dave was still a part of KW. And I heard Dave say a couple times, and I didn't like it when I first heard it. I'm going to be real honest with you. I didn't like it. And yet, some of these words ring truer than a lot of others. And here's what he said. There is no problem in your business that lead generation cannot solve. There's no problem in your business right now or in the future or in the past. There's no problem in your business that lead generation cannot solve. Lead generation's the answer, guys. Whatever your ailment in your business, lead generation is always the prescription. And guys, if you don't believe me, again, we just read it on page 99. Check it out right there for yourself. The number of qualified leads you have are either helping you grow your business, stay in business, or putting you out of business. That's what it's all about. We can try to make it really exciting and fun and unique and different and new. And bottom line, at the end of the day, it all comes back to how many qualified leads you have. That's the business you're in. Now, you may not like that, but I love you too much to tell you anything different. Until you have enough leads, which we're going to hear here, nothing else matters. Okay? Further down, the bottom of page 99, the last paragraph. When I taught new, a new agent sales training class, I would sometimes start my class discussion on leads by asking the audience, if I told you there was an out-of-town buyer who just got in this morning, who'd be paying cash and needs to purchase a home by the end of the week, could any of you help him out? And he goes on to say, of course, everyone in the room's hand does what? They all went up. Because of course they want to help that person. And he says here, on the top of page 100, well, I can guarantee there's a buyer getting into town today who has cash and needs to buy a house now. The problem is, we don't know where or who this buyer is. Right now in your market, there is somebody that fits this description. The only problem you have is you don't know who they are or where they are. Lead generation solves that problem. Now, further down here, this is a key right here, right underneath that one sentence below what we just read on the top of page 100. In a prosperous market, there are usually many agents relying on passive lead generators, casual referrals, and luck, underline luck, to create business. I call this lead receiving. Guys, circle, 
I call this lead receiving. Circle that part of the sentence. This is so important because right now inside of the National Association of Realtors, this is a large majority of practitioners that call themselves real estate salespeople. This is a big group. Look at the words he used to describe that. And yes, we're slowing down here because it's that important, okay? Look at this. Passive lead generators, casual referrals, luck. None of these things are proactive. None of these things are strategic. None of these things are purposeful. All of them are sitting back and waiting for good things to happen. Now he calls this lead receiving and he's absolutely right. He goes further on to say here, unfortunately, real estate agents who are in the business of lead receiving may find themselves selling very few houses when the market shifts. Now, if you haven't seen that around your office, you're about to, because we're seeing it across the country. There were a lot of people who thought in a good market, they were God's gift to real estate. They were amazing. And as soon as the market shifts, they realize very quickly, they weren't lead generating, they were lead receiving. You understand that anybody can be a lead receiver in this business. There's a reason that only two out of 10 make it past the second year in this business because those people are lead generators. Now he goes further on to say here, Conversely, if you actively and systematically, underline those two words, if you actively and systematically focus on lead generating through direct prospecting, underline that too, direct prospecting and marketing activities, you'll always be doing the best you can, even in shifting markets. You understand that you all probably already in your time, no matter how long you've been in this business, you've probably seen agents come into the market and go back out and they lead received. And so they come in and they pop off their first two to three referrals that they have that are the easy gimmies, the low hanging fruit, the friends and the family. And then after that, crickets, and they get out of the business. It's because they were lead receiving. They were not actively or purposefully doing systematized lead generation, which we're gonna talk about. Now, a little further on, if you count on the market to deliver leads when times are good, you better count on it to take them away when times are bad. No truer words have been spoken about lead generation, guys. Again, it's middle of page 100. If you count on the market to deliver leads when times are good, you'd better count on it to take them away when times are bad. And boy, this happens every single time. I've been through two or three major shifts in my career. This happens every single time. Don't miss that point. Further down page 100, he asks a question. And he uses this question when he's consulting people one-on-one. -on -one. And oh, by the way, he still does today. Here's the question. Do you have enough leads that if you close them properly, you'd be reaching your goals? That question probably should be highlighted in your book. That question probably should be underlined and you probably should be asking yourself that question right now. If you were able to close, properly close all the leads you have right now, do you have enough to hit your goals? He goes on to say, if they answer yes, then it would seem they have a conversion problem, meaning I have enough at-bats, I'm not converting enough of them to business. That's okay. That's fine. We can fix that. Now, if they answer no, I tell them to put everything else on hold and what? Go get more leads. You understand leads are the most important part of your business. Nothing else matters. Absolutely nothing else matters until you have enough leads for your business. This is why I said today's session might be one of the most important in the book. Because until you get this stuff figured out, everything else that we talk about is probably not gonna matter to you because you probably won't have a business big enough or be in a position to utilize or implement what else we go through. Do you currently have enough leads to hit your goal? If yes, you have a conversion problem. That's a skill problem. You can take classes, you can learn, and you can grow in that area. Life is good. If no, then you need to go back to the drawing board and generate more leads. Either way, you have hope. Either way, there's a, a path and a plan that you can implement. But you have to ask yourself that question. Really, really important question. Next, next paragraph down. The catch is that lead generation is not something that can just be turned on and off. What's he talking about here? What he's talking about is the real estate agent income roller coaster. Now, you've all seen it. It's probably not you who's taking this ride, but you all know an agent who's taking this ride to where we get really, really, really hungry because we have no money. We're broke. And so we lead generate like we've never lead generated before. We just hustle. We work. We grind. We make the phone calls. We do the activities. And lo and behold, the results show up. 
And all of a sudden we get busy and now we get so busy and it's by the way, not that busy, but it feels that busy because we went from zero miles an hour to 60. 60 feels screaming fast if you're used to going zero. We get a few clients we work with and what do we automatically stop? We stop doing the activities that got us the business because we're trading tomorrow's business for today's. This is what Gary means by saying lead generation is not something that we turned on or off. You don't have an off button on lead generation. If you want to grow a big business, your, your business, your machine is not built with an off button for lead generation. Lead generation is the one thing you never get to stop doing. Now, a lot of you, and he addresses this in the book. It's almost as if he's a smart guy. He addresses this in the book that when that comes, he knows what a lot of us are going to be thinking. Maybe because he's had the same thought. He knows what a lot of us are going to be thinking. And that's this. Well, I'm so busy, I can't handle the extra business. So if I'm already swamped now, why in the world would I continue to build more of it? Why in the world would I continue to bail water into my boat instead of out of it? Now, is that a great thought? No, it's a dumb one. But is it fair and have we all had it? Yes, right? So I'm just like you. We've had these thoughts. Gary has too. Here's his point. You still don't get to turn off lead generation. Look at the bottom of 100. Lead generation stays on even when the volume might appear overwhelming. Underline that section. Because if you use this as an excuse and you've gone through this series with me before, I'm going to point you back to here and say, do not collect $200. Do not, collect, do not pass go. You need to reread this section of the book. Lead generation stays on even when the volume might appear overwhelming. Then it keeps going on the next page. This isn't a problem. Too many leads is a good thing. Underline, highlight, circle, star, that, word, that sentence. Top of page 101. Too many leads is a good thing. And this is Ben's opinion, but too many of us use that as an excuse to not lead generate. Too many leads is a good thing. I had this very conversation with a team here locally yesterday that I was helping. Not even a part of United Home Group, the, part that I, the group that I'm a part of. I had a conversation with a team yesterday about this very thing. And they were hiding behind, we shouldn't do more lead generation because we couldn't handle the business if it came in. Guys, what's the key? He goes on to say on the top of page 101, the bottom line is you get too many leads. Are there plenty of agents in your marketplace that would be happy to pick up a referral from you and run with it and pay you mailbox money? Yes or yes? Yes! There's probably half of your market center that would be dying for that referral right now. And oh, by the way, when the market turns, you get that business back because you keep the clients. They're just simply a showing assistant or helping you. They're leverage for you without having to have a team member or grow your own team. Too many leads is a good thing. And too many of us think too many leads is a bad thing. We have to change that mindset. And if not, if not checked, if not put into check and in proper perspective, that mindset, that limiting belief will limit your business. It will limit your income and it's going to limit your life. Too many leads is a good thing. Now, last paragraph in that section on 101, he says this, you need to make sure you're not in the business of lead receiving and make sure you're always in the business of lead generating and stay in it. Until you have enough leads to exceed your goals, there is no other issue. Now, again, we're humans. We're friends here, circle of trust. I'm not judging, no judging. We all fall into the victimhood mentality of thinking that there's plenty of other things wrong with our business. And guess what? There probably are. And none of them matter as much as generating enough leads. Because, oh, by the way, when you generate enough leads to do enough business, you have extra revenue that you can hire to help fix other parts of your business. Is it messy? Absolutely. And you're never going to go far if you aren't just coming to terms with the fact that's the way life works. That's the way business works. That's the way your business has to work if you want to have the life you want to have in your business and from your business. Now, keep going on page 101. He talks about listings, the high leverage maximum earning opportunity. And I don't think anyone here will disagree with this yet. The majority of the National Association of Realtors focuses on buyer leads. So most people, when I'm teaching across the country, most people, you see all the heads go like this when we say, yeah, you all know that listings are the best, best path of leverage, right? It's the best way to build your business on listings, right? Everyone says, yep, yep, totally get that. Yet when we look at a cross section of the National Association of Realtors, the majority of agents are heavier on buyer sides than they are on listing sides. Now, 
there's a chasm there. We understand one thing, but we're showing up and doing another. So let's talk about this. First paragraph in that section, he says this, the second most important L is listings. While leads are vital to your sales business, seller listings are critical to your ability to build it to its highest level with the lowest costs and highest net. Now, we could go a long time on this section, but let me boil it down for you here. Page 102, he gives you all the reasons. For all you high C naysayers, he gives you all the reasons on page 102. And here's what we know. Here's what we know. And here's his point. Every person listening to this or watching this live or recorded, every person on this call has a capacity of how many buyers they can work with to at the same time deliver the service they wish to deliver. Meaning there's a threshold of how many buyers you can work with before your service to those clients starts going down. His point is with listings, that workload is three and four times what it can be with buyers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that means you haven't had a listing or haven't had enough of them. Because a properly marketed listing requires very little of your time and it allows you maximum exposure for your business from a marketing perspective and a lead generation perspective to generate more buyer leads as a result of properly marketing the listing you took. Now, I'm not saying neither is he that buyers are bad. We're not saying that. Yes, buyer business is a great part of your business. However, what we are saying, what he is saying is that unless you are fine with where your business is at now, unless you are absolutely fine with where your business is at now, how much money you're making, you have to embrace the fact that you need to have a big part of your business be listings. I've never met, never met an agent who had the life they wanted, the business the size they wanted, working in the amount of time they chose to work, and they were solely focused or majority focused on buyers. Guys, it's a time issue. It's a capacity. It's a ceiling. It's just not possible. I'm not saying don't work buyers. What I am saying is how purposeful are you focusing on building the listing side of your business? Page 103. About halfway through that first paragraph on page 103 he says this, over time, they'll hire one or more buyer specialists to work with the buyer side of the business and concentrate their energy on the high return, high leverage business of listings. What's he talking about? Well, you read it, so you know what he's talking about. He's talking about the focus groups that contributed to this book. One of the many common themes they saw across all of these incredibly high producers, these people who are not only beating the odds, but setting a whole new bar for what's possible in real estate, one of the most common themes they saw is at some point in time, they shifted their focus to be more on listings than on buyers. It doesn't mean they got rid of the buyer business. What it means is they brought in leverage or help to be able to keep the buyer side going while they focus purposefully on growing the listing side. Now, whether you're an individual agent, whether you're a team, whether you're on a team, like this applies to all of us no matter what. Now, a lot of teams allow you to do both. I would do both. If I'm you, I would do both. I would shoot for at least a 50-50 split between buyers and sellers. And only you know what that split is right now. How is your business split up between buyers and sellers? Only you know. Yet what I would challenge you to do before this video is done or before the, this day is out after watching the video is to actually look at how is your business split up right now between buyers and sellers? What's the gap between where you are and getting it to at least a 50-50 equal split between buyers and sellers? And then coming up with a specific action plan that you need to follow to move your business in that direction. Guys, I promise you your income, your sanity, your life balance, all of those things will thank you for taking 30 minutes after this video and walking through that exercise. And only you can do it because only you have that data. Now, bottom of page 103, that last section on 103, leverage. The who, how, and what of real estate says this. The interesting thing about the third L, leverage, is that if you focus on the first two Ls, which are leads and listings, and do a great job, you'll eventually have no choice but to either make less money or jump into becoming leveraged. Now, when I've taught this across the country before, here's what I always hear. I don't want to build a team. So this part doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter to me. This is not applicable to me. I'm not interested in building a team. Okay, wrong. Love you, wrong. This is absolutely crucial to you. I would say if you're not going to build a team, it's more crucial and more important to you than it is for those that are going to build a team. Here's why I say that. Look at page 104. 
Top of page 104, he says this, until you've maxed out on what you can accomplish through focus on leads and listings, you should not be hiring another person. Why? Red light, green light. You do it when you need it. Now, I'm going to go in the weeds here a little bit, but I promise you it's relevant. Here's the deal. I've watched for years people jump into leverage too quickly. The other thing I've also seen is people, when they hear leverage, they automatically think the only type of leverage in their mind is people leverage. And there's three kinds of leverage which we're going to talk about. And two should come before people. And we'll talk about that too. Here's what I've seen a lot of people make the mistake of. They ramp up in their business, right? Now, let's say like, just like the analogy we used before, let's say your business right now is bumping along and you're doing one or two a month. You purposely focus on these three L's, you get to four and five a month. Is four or five a month going to feel insane compared to two or three a month? Yes. It's going to feel fast. It's going to feel like you're missing details. You're going to feel out of control. Guess what? Deal with it. It's the same as you felt when you went from zero a month doing three a month. It's all perspective. So you're going to build your business. You're going to focus on these three L's. You're going to increase your business and the natural tendency to try to do a pressure relief and feel better about the chaos that you're feeling and experiencing is I need to hire a person because Gary said I need to have leverage. And I've seen too many people too quickly jump right into hiring a person. They have no systems. They have no other forms of leverage. They have no idea what it is they're doing. They don't know how to lead themselves much less than anybody else and yet they jump right into hiring a person. Now, everybody watching this, you probably can guess the success rate of those situations and relationships. It's not high. So let's look at this. Red light, green light means we only take action to add leverage when the business tells us that we can. Now that means we need to know our numbers, which we'll talk about, but we only add leverage of any type when our business tells us it's time. And what I have to tell you is a lot of times, or most times for me at least, and I'm guessing you're not too different for me in this way, a lot of times for me, my head tells me that I'm ready for leverage before my business does. And if I'm a true believer in red light, green light, if I'm really sold out to this concept, if I believe, it's not about believing Gary Keller, it's about believing all the agents that contributed to this book. If I'm sold out and believing that these people are successful and that success leaves clues, I have to choose to stop acting on my emotion and start acting on logic. And that's what red light, green light helps me do. We'll help you do the same thing in your business if you allow it. Look in the middle of page 104. Leverage answers three key questions in your business. Now guys, out of your book, this page should be dog-eared, should have little tab things on it. This page should be set apart from other pages. And here's why, it's this section. Leverage answers three key questions in your business. Here we go, the first one, who's going to do it? So that's people leverage. This is the one people default to. This is the only one people think of in the heat of the moment. This is the one where people make big mistakes often. So who's going to do it? It's not a bad question, it's not a bad a form of leverage. But a lot of people skip to it and skip some other ones. Number two, how will they do it? That's systems leverage systems leverage. And number three, what will they do it with? And that's tools. Now, coaching people for years in real estate, when they feel that pressure of chaos in their business because they've doubled their business, even if it's only to go to four or five a month, if it's gone from one, from one to two to four or five, it's chaotic. It feels chaotic. I get it. I'm not downplaying that. But a lot of people's first tendency is, oh, that means I need to go hire a person. No, you don't. There are two other forms of leverage you need to work in first. Red light, green light. You don't have the resources or revenue long enough, consistently enough yet to hire a person. What it means is you need to bring in systems leverage and tools leverage. Now, right under that, he says, you might say leverage is the who, how, and what of your real estate business when you're not the only one doing it. Further down on 104, he says, now the challenge is to add the right people because the impact could be positive or negative. This is what we were talking about before. A lot of people move too quickly through the process of getting leverage. They go people leverage before systems and tools. And as a result of being in a rush, they don't follow the CV process or the disc profile or whatever process you use. I don't care. It's not my point of this group. But whatever process other people use and have had success with, most people in reaction mode for the pain and the pressure of their business being crazy, skip the interview process, skip logic and go straight with emotion and hire based on emotion and based on need. 
And his point here is you need to slow down and take your time because anytime you bring any people into your world, whether it's an employee or any capacity inside of your organization, it has a positive or a negative impact, but you don't get to not have an impact. It always has an impact. Who are you allowing into your world? Too many of us act too quickly on emotion instead of stopping, sitting back, using logic, playing red light, green light, and assessing the situation. I want you guys to really hear me on this. You need to, top producing agents, millionaire real estate agents, they respond, they don't react. And too many salespeople in real estate react, and that's all based on emotion, and no good decision comes out of emotion, all right? Bottom of page 104, this is a big one too, and it's not just for people, but that's the context that's here, but man, this applies to our business in so many areas. Good is good, and great is great. And although good can really help, great can actually change your business forever. Therefore, it's crucial that you avoid settling for people who are merely filling gaps and you do not have capacity to grow. Who are you growing your business with? Now, if you're a solo agent, your first hire, which we'll get into in future sessions as part of the path to the seven levels, your first hire is an admin, not a buyer's agent. Your first path is an admin hire. Now, if you're an agent on a team, you get to skip a lot of this stuff because you already have all this leverage around you, right? You don't have to go through the pain of this process. You've got to, you get to slingshot through this to learn from everyone else's mistake. So if you're not getting better results than the other people listening to this who are on their own, then that's something we need to go internal on and look at ourselves and where do I need to shore up and grow? Because I've got access to all of this stuff already. What am I doing with it? Okay. Further on page 105, he says, after you've hired bad, good is great. That's true, but the greater truth is once you've experienced great, good just isn't good enough. And that shows up in every area of our life, not just our business. Now, middle page 105, do not underestimate the importance of this first hire. And he talks a lot about the first hire and the first hire being an admin hire. An admin hire. Somebody that can come in and help you systematize. Somebody that can help you come in and take things from you. Guys, 14 years in the business. Let me tell you about red light, green light, practical example. 14 years in the business. I ran the number one Century 21 office in the world for eight years. I ran and turned around a market center in Keller Williams. I just got my first executive assistant this year. I've never had less than two jobs, (laughs) right? You, You talk about being busy, I hear you. I'm busy too, I get it. I totally get it. And it took me 14 years for red light, green light to show up and say it's absolutely time for me to hire an executive assistant. Now, what I'll also tell you is my form of leverage in this example was people. To get 14 years without a person, I had a lot of systems and a lot of tools. I'm one of the most systematized people you will meet. And it's not because that's who I am naturally, that's because who I had to be out of necessity. Where in your business do you need to systematize and bring in tools to help you be multiple places at once and help you deliver the level of service you want in the time you want to give it? You're not a victim to your business. We just allow ourselves to be at times. Where do you need to work in people, or excuse me, systems and tools leverage on your path to getting to where you need people leverage? What I'll tell you is all leverage, people, systems, and tools, guys, they can all radically transform your business. It's up to you to find out all the time where the need is inside of your business. And we got some questions coming up that we can ask to help discover those things. Okay, let's go to the next page. Page 107. We start in the eight goal categories of the MREA. Now, three L's are absolutely massively important. Not a doubt about it. They are absolutely important. The eight goal categories are just as important. That's why I said this session could be one of the most important from the book. This session could be one of the most important because it's one of the most foundational of the book. If you want to build all the other stuff we're going to go through on the rest of the sessions, you have to get these down. You have to have a basic understanding of these and you have to start executing and implementing these. Now, Let's look at the eight goal categories. Bottom of 107. I want to read this paragraph. Yes, I know you can read. Yet it's important. I want to read this paragraph on the bottom of 107. Read it with me. It's the fourth quarter. Quick, what's the score? Who has the ball and how much time is left? Don't you expect everyone on your favorite football or basketball team to know these simple facts? Of course you do. People expect the players on their team to know the key information about the game at any point. Underline that. At any point during the game and after. 
You're in business. You're treating it like a game and you're no different. You and everyone on your team need to know your key numbers at all times. Now, let me tell you something really disturbing. I've had the privilege over 14 years to work with some people much more talented than I am. And crazy as it may seem, they've actually asked me to coach them. So here are people much smarter than I am and they've asked me to come alongside them and give them insight and go on this ride and this journey with them of building their business. And the scariest thing I've seen in 14 years, majority of these people don't know their numbers. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you know your numbers, but here's what I find every time I'm in a coaching call or in a coaching meeting with somebody, every time. There are parts of the business that I ask about that the answer I get is, I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. I don't know. Now, I'm not talking about little things like what ply toilet paper do you buy for your office? I'm talking about important things for your business, the eight goal category things. These eight areas, you should always know your numbers in because these eight areas are most predictive of your success. So let's dive into this. Now, middle of page 108, he says there are two sets of numbers the millionaire real estate agent is always aware of. Number one is your goal numbers. <coughs> your goal numbers, where do I want to be? Number two is your actual numbers. Now, if you're in my world or you've been in any of my classes, you know that we talk about this a lot, goal versus actual. Because knowing these two numbers gives us an absolute compass or a roadmap to know what we need to do to get back on pace. Or to stay ahead of pace, whatever the case may be. He says, the first set defines your annual goals for your business. The second set, if monitored on a weekly or at least monthly basis, is like that compass. Now, what we know is most agents in goal setting, most agents don't do goal setting. Those that do goal setting, most of that group does it one time in December or January. They put it on a piece of paper and they put it in the drawer. And the next time they look at it is when they're cleaning out their desk in November for the next year and they find this sheet with goals on it and they go, oh, I was way off. Gary said it to me this way in a mastermind one time. He said, look, he said, you think about a tanker, one of those big seafaring tankers, right? Container ships, whatever you want to look at, but a big ship. It takes a long time to turn those things around. We're talking a lot of minutes to turn those things around. Why? Because they're massive and it takes a lot of momentum and force and energy to start just slowly turning those ships around. Now I want you to think about a speedboat, something you'd ski behind, water ski behind. Those things can turn on a dime. The challenge is as our businesses get bigger, they become more and more like that ocean liner, like that big freighter ship. And they take a long time to turn around. And most agents, unfortunately, treat their business like that big ship. And they don't check in on their goals. And as a result, they get to November and it's too late. They can't turn it around. Too much time has passed. There's not enough time left in the year. I can't change what it is. And so they throw their hands up in the air and they say, Jesus, take the wheel. And they hope next year's going to be different, even though they don't do anything different. What these things allow you to do is be that speedboat. Having your goals versus your actual allows you to check in on a weekly basis. Where do I need to be on pace? Where am I actually on pace? And allows you 52 check-in points throughout the year to say, okay, what do I need to do this week to be on pace for this month goal to keep me on pace for my annual goal? Goal versus actual is one of the simplest things in the world, and it's also one of the most effective in your business if you track these numbers on a regular basis. Now, page 109, he lists the eight goal categories. And if you don't have these done in your business, Guys, right now it is May 3rd, 2019. It's not too late. By the way, I don't care if you watch this November 2019 or in future years, it's never too late. You should have these eight goal categories nailed. And I want you to dog ear page 109 because this is gonna take you more time to go through and really stew on than we have left in our time together today. The eight goal categories are this, leads generated, listings, contracts written, contracts closed, money, people, systems and tools, and personal education. Now, in that box at the bottom there, this is key, and I want you to highlight this. For each of these eight goal categories, you should set someday, three year, one year, one month, one week goals. Now, a lot of you use the 411. That's a tool we have at Kelly Williams. It's a phenomenal tool. 
It's simple, it's basic. It allows the course corrections. Guys, if you use the 411, you understand you have your weekly, monthly, and yearly goals already knocked out. You already have a tool that you should already be using to track your weekly, monthly, and annual goals. Don't miss simple things just because they're simplistic in nature. Guys, these have profound benefits and profound effect on your business if you use them. Page 110. This is what I think is key as well. We're talking about business planning. Right above the gray box there with the quote, he says, if you don't have a system that can be reused each year with little change, you really have to work at setting goals. His point is this, when you set your goals in the eight goal categories, goal setting each year becomes easier because you're not having to recreate the wheel each and every year. What are you doing? You're just simply modifying and tweaking the goals you already had set the year before. This is a system. This is a part of leverage. Using the eight goal categories to inform your goal setting process is very, very effective if, again, you choose to use it. Now, bottom of page 110, he unpacks the first goal category in depth, leads generated. He says this, leads are the most important number you need to know. Of course, because he said earlier, leads are the only issue. We all agreed with it. You must know how many leads you must generate to meet your other goals. Now, Here's what I also know. Most agents track nothing. So if you're that agent and you track nothing, this is going to be hard for you at first. And that's okay. It's not an excuse not to do it. The way we know how many leads we need to generate is by tracking our conversion rate. The only way I'm going to know how many leads I need to hit my goal is to know how effective I am at handling and converting the leads I get. Now, if you haven't tracked that before, that's fine. Start today. And don't worry about overcomplicating this. Don't be an average human and make things more complex than they need to be. It literally can be a legal pad or it can be one of these, as you can see in my office, one of these big sticky notepads where you track how many dials, how many conversations, how many appointments set, how many appointments gone on, how many contracts written, how many closings. From start to finish, soup to nuts, we're tracking from the very first time I pick up the phone and dial a number, how many of those do I need in order to get to my goal? You understand that when you track your business at that simple, rudimentary, granular level, when you track your business that way, it becomes simple. It's not easy. It's not without hard work, but your business becomes simple because now you know exactly what you need to do. Now it's a numbers game. Now you know if you've had one of those days where it's no, 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 or not a lot of connections, no big deal. I'm doing the activity. I know my yes is right around the corner. You only have that empowering you if you're tracking the numbers and you know your numbers. Now, page 111. He talks about the second goal category of the MREA, it's listings. Your entire business model should be built around obtaining a certain number of seller listings each month and year. Again, not saying don't work with buyers, not even a little bit saying that. But do you know how many listings you need each month and each year in order to hit your goal? A lot of people don't. Getting clarity there first is your first assignment. Second then is coming up with a plan of how do you find that amount of seller listing leads each month to get that number of listings or signs on the ground each month. Bottom of 111, he says this, if you choose to track only two areas of your business, you might want to underline this. If you choose to only track two areas of your business, track your leads and your listings. Now, we've had pushback on this in the ro- on the road too, teaching this. And that's what's interesting. He's not saying don't track everything else. But what he also knows is he's talking to real estate agents. And so if you're used to tracking nothing, telling you to track eight things might be a little bit of a stretch. So what he's saying is if you're going to start, if you're only going to track two things, the two most important things to track are your leads needed and your listings needed. The reason he says that is because all of the others will fall into place as a result. So if you're not tracking a lot of things in your business, start there with those two things. Bottom of page 111, leads and listings. Track those two things. You'll build the habit. Then you can start adding in more to track. Look at page 112. Third goal category is contracts written. Now he says, you need to know about your sales contracts written. You need to know three things. The number of units written, the total volume written, and the gross income written. Now, right below that's the fourth goal goal category and it's contracts closed. So we're tracking both contracts written and contracts closed. 
Now, a little caveat here, and you can see my notes. I wrote this in last night as I was going back through here because I want to make sure we hit this. It's important to track all of these things. Volume written and volume closed is absolutely important. Yet anybody in my world that I speak to on a regular basis or coach, they know that we very rarely talk about volume. And here's the reason. We focus on units because volume is out of your control. Sales volume is determined by average price in your market. An average price in your market is something you have zero control over. Interest rates affect it. Demand affects it. Supply affects it. Lots of things affect the average price in the market. The real estate agent is not one of those things. So when you're in my world, or if you want it to best practice of top agents across the country, you don't focus as much on volume. You focus on what? You focus on units. Because units is what you can control. And when you build a business based on how many closed units, how many written units, how many pending units, when you build your business on units, you've built a business that's insulated from shifts. You've built a business that doesn't care whether the market's up or down because it's focused on something you can control, which makes you focus on the activities needed to get to those closed units. That just means that when the market gets better, you make more money because the average price goes higher. And when the market shifts down, that's okay. You're still making the money you want to make because you've got the units, the volume, the number of units to make up for the difference in the average price. Keep your laser focus on how many units and the activities required to get to the units. Don't fall into the trap of focusing on volume. And here's an example. I have a person that I help coach in California and their average price is nearly a million dollars a transaction. Now, I also have some people that I'm close with that are in the Southeast. And their average price is 175. The person in California, if they focus on volume, thinks they're way better than they actually are. And the person in the Southeast can be defeated or feel defeated by focusing on volume. The one thing we can all control, the one thing that equals out every real estate market is number of units sold. I don't care about your sales volume. I care about what I can control and what I can control is the activities needed to get to the units written, pended, and closed. Bottom of 112, fifth goal category is money. Now, he gives us some issues. He says the big money issues to track are, and then the bottom of 112, gross closed income. How much money did I make? The budget. How much money did I spend? Net income. How much money did I earn as profit? We're going to go into it. And some people listening to this may not know the difference between gross and net income. That's okay. We're going to talk about it because you're a business. Number four, agent compensation. How much do I, the agent, personally get to take home? Because the other thing a lot of people don't realize is just because your business makes money doesn't mean that you personally make money. We're going to talk about that. All right. Now, Here's what I want to tell you as well. And we're going to talk about from a money standpoint, we're going to go further in depth, I believe in two or three sessions. What's interesting to me is I hear this a lot too. We were in, I think I was in California teaching something around this. Anyway, it was a couple of years ago. But the conversation came up, a person came to me, they said, hey, I'm on a team, did this money exercise. I should go out on my own. I said, oh, okay, maybe, maybe let's talk through that. And they were looking at it saying, oh, well, well, I, I paid my team X number of dollars absolutely. You absolutely did. No disputing. That's right there on paper. Um, yet what you're getting hung up on, Mr. Agent, in this example, uh, what you're getting hung up on is your gross income versus your net. Let's look at your expenses. And guys, what I want you to hear is whether you're a single agent building a team, that's cool. If you're a team owner, that's cool. If you're an agent on a team, that's cool. These are not telling you to do or not do anything. What they're doing is telling you what to inspect on a regular basis inside your business. Because what that person didn't understand is their net percentage of gross income was higher than if they were going to go out on their own. And we're going to talk about that in the MREA later. Gary gives 42% as the target number of net. The net income target, 42% of the gross income for the millionaire real estate agent team. And guys, I can tell you, being in Gary's group and talking to a lot of these people for a number of years, I don't know many that hit 42% of their gross income as a net profit margin. Yet I know a lot of members of teams who are higher than 42%, right? So all I'm saying is we're going through the money. You need to track your money for your sake. We always want to look at the net income percentage, okay? 
So just know that. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk more about that. He's, there's a whole section on it that we will go through. Look at page 113. The sixth goal category of the millionaire real estate agent is people. People are the first and most important type of leverage you bring to your sales business. Later on, he says the three uh, key goal areas you'll always have to address regarding your people are one, number one, recruiting. What people needs do I have? Number two is training. What training needs do I have? Number three, consulting. Further down there, he says, even if you do not currently have any people needs, it's important that you keep this placeholder in your goals. Begin with the end in mind. Further down on 113, he says, eventually you'll be looking to the future saying, if this continues for much longer, I'll need to have help. So even if it's not relevant to you today, it may be in the future, it's worth going through and asking yourself these questions regardless of your current situation. Page 114, the seventh goal category, systems and tools. Guys, this is huge and there's so much here. Each one of these categories could be an hour long call, okay? But for time's sake, a couple of highlights I had and I want to hit these points as we're getting close to the end of our time. Top of page 114, he says, after people, systems and tools make up the remainder of your leverage. Systems are about documenting your methods. You want your people to document your methods and then be able to duplicate your excellent results. One of the biggest things, pushback we get from people when it comes to hiring people is, oh, people are only loyal to me. They only want to work with me. And unfortunately, I hate to burst your ego bubble, but that's just crap. They don't care about working just with you. They're not loyal to you. They're loyal to the, your standards and the way you do business. You can absolutely have other people in your organization deliver the same service level, have the same standards when you have a system that documents how you do business. Further down on 114, it says this, tools are everything from computers, equipment, and phone systems to something as simple and vital as a job description. Systems and tools, two different things, both play a key role inside of your business, regardless of your situation. Now, towards the bottom of 114, he says, the systems tools goal category manifests itself as the following questions. These are big. What new systems or tools do I need to add? And the second question we should be asking ourselves on a regular basis in regards to systems and tools, what current systems or tools do I need to improve or upgrade? Never resting on your laurels. Guys in the team, I'm part of United Home Group. We break things as fast as we build them. We've gone from 90 agents to almost 300 in a year's time. <laughs> like 16 months we've grown that. What worked there doesn't work here. So the reason he has these questions in here for you, regardless of where your business is at and size and all that, it's irrelevant. The, the point is, we always have to be asking ourselves these questions because we can never just get comfortable with the systems we have in place. Because that's the first day we start losing is when we rest on our laurels and we get comfortable using what we've always done or doing what we've always done because we've always done it, okay? There's always a way we can improve, tweak, or modify. And it starts by asking ourselves those questions on a regular basis. Now, page 115, the eighth goal category, personal education. And if you couldn't tell, I'm passionate about this one. Personal education. 115, towards the middle, he says, your personal education goal category will show up in your thinking as, number one, what knowledge do I need to learn? What skills do I need to acquire? So based on my current reality, my current situation, you know you better than anybody. The first question to ask yourself is, what knowledge do I need to learn? And what skills do I need to acquire or develop? Number two, what knowledge do the individuals on my staff need to learn? What skills do they need to acquire? You understand all these questions we should be asking ourselves all the time. Constantly pushing, constantly creating healthy tension, pulling and pushing the business into greatness, into where it needs to be. Never allowing it to get complacent or stop. Now, here's what I know. And I hear this with agents a lot of the time. I'm comfortable. And they use that as a reason as to why they're not growing or why they're not doing hard things or why they're not taking classes or all the things. They use it as an excuse. And I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I did take a lot of phys physics in college. I have a degree in aeronautics. And the one thing I learned, a very expensive piece of paper, the one thing I learned that I can take away from that is this. Physics tells me that it is absolutely, literally impossible to coast. There is no such thing as coasting or maintaining. Physics tells me because of gravity, you're either going up or you're going down. 
So I don't care if you're comfortable with your income. I don't care if you're happy with the size of your organization and your business. That doesn't give you the right to stop asking yourselves these questions on a regular basis. Because in doing that, you're lying to yourself and that's the beginning of the death spiral of your business. Don't go there. Always ask yourself these questions. Even if you don't want to do any more business, there are other people around you who would and could and would be grateful for it. Remember what we talked about in the beginning of this session, too many leads is a good thing. Don't hide behind, I don't want to do the work as a, a reason not to ask yourself these questions, not to grow, not to push, and not to dig in and do the hard work of your business. Now, page 116 as we're wrapping up. In the conclusion section, he says this, if you can do these things or those things, you'll be very well positioned to apply the models we'll describe in the next chapter, earn a million, and start taking your real estate career to a higher place. Guys, the three L's in the eight goal categories literally are classes that I've taught before for eight hours apiece. We spent just short of an hour going through it together today. That's not enough to do it justice, yet I trust it's enough to get you started in understanding why these two areas are such crucial parts of this book, why these two areas are so important and worth your time to continue in study of past our hour together today. So thank you all for being on the call today. Next week, we are session five, the four models. Guys, this is also a huge part. We're going to be going over pages 128 through 172 next Friday, same time, same place. Thank you all for being on the call. Have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you guys later.